All right, uh, welcome. I'm Timon Gare. I'm talking. I will talk about Bayonet probabilistic inference for networks, which is joint work with uh, Sasha, Peter, Laura, Pascal, and Martin. So this is a computer network, and we want to understand its behavior. But the issue is that uh, some of its behavior is uh, is unknown. There's some uncertainty about it. For example. Uh, there's some traffic that will arrive at some point because somebody will send it over the network and we don't necessarily control when that will happen. And even if there are bursts of traffic, we may still want to understand like, how often will this traffic now actually overload our network. Then uh, there's also the possibility that some components in the network fail. So for example, here there's a link between S1 and S2. And with probability p fail, it will go down, and then we cannot send any packets through this network. And this will have some uh, effects. For example, uh, packets may get dropped, or there will be some sort of rescheduling, and packets will go over other links and then cause congestion there, and so on. And uh, last but not least, there are also probabilistic uh, load balancing protocols, such as ECMP. I mean, it's technically it's not probabilistic, but it operates on the, the packet header and the packet header of, of a packet is probabilistic, so we can uh, model it as a probability. Oops. Then uh, the, the problem of, of understanding kind of sort of the behavior of uh, networks is quite important. So there's been some existing work uh, in programming languages in particular. So this is an example uh, from PropNetCat, which was uh, I mean, some, some paper was published at Popl 17, for example. Uh, this part of the program uh, gives you the probabilistic forwarding rules. So here we have a case where uh, a packet is forwarded probabilistically. Uh, this part uh, gives you the structure of the network. And here we have actually have a link that may go down probabilistically. And in the end, there's some checks. So they want to figure out whether the packet will arrive at switch S4. And what they do is they give some denotation as semantics of their language here, and then just expand it by brute force. And meanwhile, of course, there's all this work on probabilistic programming. So what you can see here is on the left is a probabilistic program that tries to estimate the bias in a, in a biased coin. So first, uh, we, we, we don't know what this bias is. So this bias P is just some uniform number between zero and one as far as we know, and then we have some uh, examples of, of coin flip results, and then we just specify that, well, we, we flip the coin a few times, and those are the outcomes. And then in the end, we can return P, and we get this probability density on the right. And here, what is important is that a probabilistic program usually at least has some part that is independent of the underlying uh, probabilistic inference algorithm, and it just specifies the model. And then we can decouple the, the model specification from the inference, and uh, the person who has the domain knowledge doesn't need to know as much as about probabilistic inference as they might otherwise have to. This probabilistic programming has a lot of applications, for example, machine learning and statistics, vision robotics, security, and as I'm going to tell you now, it also has applications in computer networks. All right, so what's our idea? Basically, we will also give some sort of probabilistic network domain-specific language. We call it Bayonet. Uh, it models the network, the forwarding rules, and uh, sources of uncertainty. And we have this probabilistic solver that we are going to use to check probabilistic assertions. And the, the, the key idea here is that we treat the probabilistic solver or the probabilistic programming system just like we would treat an SMT solver in the deterministic case. So in particular, we are going to use uh, PSI, which is a probabilistic solver which we published at CAF 16. Uh, here you, you see a more uh, interesting example where the uh, PDF doesn't look like a Gaussian. So PSI can mix discrete and continuous distributions, and we also support the high order programs. And what PSI does, it does exact probabilistic inference by symbolic reasoning. And so you can get the, the PDF of the result, you can get the expectation of the result and other things like the probability that the program will actually crash. And uh, this is what we are going to translate our Bayonet programs into. So this is the, the flow of our approach. We start with some Bayonet program in our uh, DSL. 
then we automatically translate it into a probabilistic program, which we feed into Psi. Then we get an output. And because Psi is symbolic, we may be able to thread through some symbolic parameters through the entire thing, and in the end, uh, pick suitable values for those symbolic parameters that make our property hold. But this, this step is optional. So now I'm going to show some examples of what uh, Bayonet can do. This is an example program where we have this topology on the left. In Bayonet, it is specified with this topology declaration shown on the right. We have six nodes and seven links between the nodes. Uh, every node has a few interfaces that are, like an interface is just a pair of nodes and part at that node. And then we will connect some interfaces to each other, which will give us bidirectional links along which nodes can send uh, packets. Then each node has a local node program that it will run that specifies how it will forward packets and, uh, and, and other things. Then it has an input queue for packets and an output queue for packets. When the, the input queues and output queues have capacities. So for example, in, in, in this program, we say that at most two packets can be in any given queue at the same time. And if we start to overflow a queue, packets may get dropped. And this is what we call a concession. So this slide gives you the, the local node programs that we're going to consider here. So this is uh, at host zero. This is where the packets will be sent. So what host zero does, it just creates three packets in order and will send them over the network. Then what switch zero is going to do, whenever uh, a packet arrives in its simple queue, it it's may execute the following program, which just uh, takes this packet and forwards it randomly to one of the output ports, one, two, or three, which, I mean, if you look at the uh, topology here, it would just go either here, here, or here. Right? And then uh, finally, at host H1, we we're we just going to count the number of packets that arrived. And in the end, we are we're querying the probability that the number of packets that arrived is smaller than what we sent. So in this case, we would have a congestion in the network. And this is the corresponding C program that was automatically translated. Uh, if the font is too small for you to read, that is not a big deal, because this is just straightforward code that simulates the behavior of the network. So in the beginning, we have a data type declaration that defines what the queue is. And then we have a few data type declarations for the individual switches. And in the end, some simulation code that uh, selects probabilistically the next action to execute and simulates it. So we could run some local node program, or we could forward a packet along a queue. And in the very end, we just return whether uh, all the packets arrived or not. But, and this is uh, what we get. So first, we, we run Bayonet to get the Psi program, and then we run Psi on the resulting program to get the exact uh, expectation or the exact probability of uh, not all packets arriving. And another example is a gossip. Here we have four nodes, and one of those nodes is infected in the beginning, and it will start to send packets. And uh, what we want to figure out is how many packets in expectation will be reached, uh, how many nodes will be in expectation reached by some packet. And how it works precisely is that this is the first node, it is infected, and it just uh, sends one new packet to some other node. And every other node, uh, will get infected whenever it receives a packet, and then it will uh, forward two copies of the packet to randomly chosen neighbors. And in the end, we are querying the expected number of uh, infected nodes. And we can again uh, send this to Psi, and in this case, it's, it tells us that the expected number of infected uh, nodes will be about 3.481. And finally, uh, we're considering this topology where we have uh, now a, a more uh, special kind of setup. So there's this node S0 that we don't know a lot about. So it's, we don't really know how it forwards the packets. We have some hypothesis, so it could either randomly forward the packets or it could always send them up or always send them down. And what we can do is we know that host H0 sends three labeled packets and at host H1 we are going to observe the sequence of packets that arrive. And now we want to infer something about this S0. 
and the local no and also what's important, I think it's not going to be shown in the code, is that this link here, it, it may fail with a certain probability which is set to 1 over 1,000. So now we have a packet field because the packets need to be distinguishable. So we assign an ID to each packet, which host H0 sets here. So it first creates a packet and then sets the ID to the count of packets that have been sent so far. Uh, then uh, switch S0 based on the, on the strategy that you're going to pick for it uh, will forward the packets. So if the strategy is one, the packet will be, uh, will be forwarded randomly. And if it's two or three, it will be uh, forwarded deterministically. And here is where we initialize the strategy. And this is just based on the prior probability. So we're saying with probability one half, the strategy is deterministic. And otherwise, we're going to forward deterministically either up or down. And then finally, we, er we observe the, the sequence of arrived packets at host H1, for which we have those observed statements that just say, well, what arrived is this. And you also have this post observed that is run in the very end, which is just saying that we, we didn't observe more. And for example, uh, what can happen is that the, the three packets that we send just arrive in order at host H1. And in this case, uh, what we can say is that it's now slightly less random, uh, slightly less uh, probable that the forwarding strategy was random. And it's a bit more likely that it was deterministic. And the reason why this is the case is that the packets were not reordered. And if the forwarding strategy is, is random, it's more likely that packets get reordered. Otherwise, if packets are always sent along the same links, uh, there is no way for them to be reordered. And this is an effect that is actually observed in real networks. But you can also see it's a bit less likely that the strategy chosen was deterministic S2. And the reason is because uh, between S2 and S3, the link could have failed, in which case uh, not, nothing would have arrived. So this is slightly less likely as a scenario. <laughs> then it's also possible that packets get reordered. And now we know for certain that the forwarding strategy was not deterministic. And this is the result that you obtain. And it's also possible that nothing arrives. And in this case, we know that all the packets must have gone down because there's, this is the only way packets can get dropped here. We don't have any uh, restrictions on the queue capacities. We just have uh, one link that could fail and consume the packets. And therefore, uh, it's now uh, less likely to be random. It could still be random, but it, if, if it was random, then we would have needs, needed to be in a special case where all the packets were routed down. So our uh, Bayonet implementation uh, first checks uh, well formedness constraints, for example. Uh, uh, we, we don't want to have multiple links connected to the same interface and, and other things like this. And for exact inference, we just translate Bayonet to C as I told you. But we also have an approximate inference backend in, uh, for which we first translate Bayonet to C, and then we have an auto translation from uh, C to WebPPL, which is an approximate inference tool. And uh, if you are interested in parameter synthesis, there's something about it in the paper. Uh, those are our results, and uh, I mean, the thing that is maybe important to note here is that not all uh, backends are equal on, on each benchmark. So for example here, I mean, one thing is the approximate results are a little bit more approximate than the exact results, of course, but also uh, sometimes the approximate backend is uh, faster and for other benchmarks, it's actually slower. All right, so to, to summarize, uh, we have this Bayonet tool that scales to interest in network sizes and it actually reuses existing probabilistic inference algorithms instead of uh, reinventing them from scratch. Thank you very much. I think I'll start us off. So uh, this looks really cool. Um, from what I can, from what I gather from the programming language, it's possible for you to write down um, a uh, traffic model that generates a potentially unbounded number of packets. And I'm curious what happens uh, in that kind of situation. Yeah, I mean the the system currently. It uh, bounds the number of execution steps. And so, I mean, what, what you can get back is 
a result that says if it terminates between the number of steps that you uh, specified, this is the result, and with this probability, it doesn't terminate it within the bound. Uh, this may be either a crazy or naive question, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Uh, have you ever thought about using this to uh, infer properties of botnets? Uh, we haven't, but... Uh, it would involve writing a model of what you think is going on and then uh, using observed traffic to, to make inferences. Yes, There's I mean, we have we've certainly thought about uh, the use case where, where you don't know everything about the network, yes, and, and, and observe some part of it. And one example was this reliability with observations, uh, but uh, we still uh, have to actually apply to, to real data. Uh, so, uh, great talk. I was, I was wondering, is it um, possible or useful even to try to learn some of the parameters inside the model from actual observe network data, or is that, is uh, that yes, useful I mean, or, or, or I think it's possible? useful. Hi, uh, nice talk. Uh, so you uh, showed a case where the approximate backend takes more time than the exact one. Can you, do you know why? Can you explain in that case? Uh, it's just uh, the structure of the problem is is simpler than for other cases, and so the exact backend can just exploit it really well because it understands what's going on. And the approximate backend needs to simulate in each case and draw a certain amount of samples. 